Welcome to the party. And uh, we've got some ground to cover, and hopefully uh, we can make it all the way through everything that I, I feel in my heart God wants us to say. But uh, the title, again, is Nothing But Net. Look at your neighbor and say, Nothing But Net. I uh, grew up, maybe you can relate to this, where whenever something was done right, you would say, Nailed it. And I am determined to make Nothing But Net the new Nailed It. Next time you see something done right, ah, oh, nothing but net. And some things to address, we've got some animals in today's talk. One, we need to talk about the mamba. Two, we need to talk about seagulls. Three, we need to talk about bear traps. Any hunters in the room? Make some noise. <laughs> 17 of you. I'm a hunter. I don't sit in a deer stand and hunt for deer, but I... I do hunt for deals at the mall. Anyone else can I get an amen? <laughs> so uh, we all hunt to some degree. And then there are four words that I think for our community of faith, we need to have established. And then there's this, uh, this diagram that I think at the end might get your interest and have you thinking about life and maybe this message um, a little bit differently. Uh, if we are going to talk about Mamba, who do you think I'm going to be referring to? Kobe Bryant. Yeah, Kobe Bryant is, in my mind, in the top five greatest players to ever pick up a basketball. I, I think that highly of him. I think his legacy, his accomplishments, and what he brought to the game of basketball is pretty outstanding. And when you talk to individuals about the game of basketball, if you ever go down a wormhole on YouTube about Kobe Bryant, one thing that you find to stand out about him is his work ethic and his mindset. In fact, over the course of his career, uh, this was uh, tagged as the Mamba mentality. Essentially, a, a Mamba being this very intimidating, venomous snake that has extreme focus uh, that you don't wanna mess with. The opponents would say he had that mentality in approaching the game. And what I think is interesting about uh, Kobe Bryant is how well documented his approach to the game is. And I say that because, you know, if you go online, recently I was watching this one like, video documentary on YouTube, and the question being posed to all these legends, Hall of Fame players, all-stars, uh, individuals who even played against Michael Jordan. And the question was, who's the most impressive player you've ever been around? the most impressive player you've ever played with. Not the greatest of all time, just the most impressive. Like, wow, that's different. And all these players were saying Kobe Bryant. And the thing that they kept referencing was uh, the way he thought about the game and his work ethic and approach, his discipline. And what is interesting to me, and you, you go through these you know, different sources and you look at the time they spent around Kobe. Maybe you look at the Olympic team with LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Chris Paul and all these other future Hall of Famers. What's interesting to me is throughout his entire career, Kobe was really generous and was oftentimes offering the secrets to his success and his approach to the game. It was made available to everybody. He wasn't trying to hide his secrets. It's very well documented. Yet it is not well duplicated. What you find is the individuals who played with them on the Olympic team would all notice, hey, every single one of us had one practice a day, but Kobe would wake up at 4 a.m. and go till 10 p.m. and he would end the day practicing four times. And what you find is individuals did not walk away from their experience with Kobe Bryant saying, that's the key to success. That is what sets a person apart for greatness. I'm going to do the same thing. And why is it not duplicated? Because it's difficult. Kobe Bryant aimed for standards that most people are intimidated to attempt. And today we're going to look at something that again uh, is a standard that is intimidating for every single one of us, but there's no doubt uh, this is something that uh, sets this individual apart as one of the greatest. If you were to ask me the question, when it comes to the Bible, who do you think is the most impressive person? Not the greatest person in terms of accomplishments and impact, but who do you find to be very impressive? And, and there's no doubt for me, the person who I think in the Bible is the most impressive person goes by the name of Job. Anyone ever read Job's story and found yourself impressed? 
Anyone ever felt the temptation to avoid Job's story? I mean, we certainly don't want to read it, but more so, we definitely don't want to experience it. Job had a very tough journey. Yet through it all, he had a different mindset and approach to his faith and a different confidence in the goodness of God and his relationship with God. And today's message is in many ways going to be a 30,000 foot flyover uh, to the book of Job. Hopefully this will create some curiosity for you and your life group uh, to do a deeper dive into the book of Job. And the book of Job is 42 chapters and we are going to span the entire book in this one message. So bear with me. If you have your Bibles, go to Job chapter one and it starts out like this. It says in verse one, in the land of us, there was a man whose name was Job. And so this is ancient times. There was this community of people that developed and they set up, you know, a habitat and a community in this region. And they decided, hey, what do we call this place? You know, it's, it's just us out here. Um, <laughs> no, <laughs> nothing but net. It's, you know, it's felt forced the entire weekend, but I'm still swinging for it. There was a man whose name was Job, and this man was blameless and upright. It's not to say he was sinless. It's just to say he was a a righteous man, a godly man. He was a man of character and integrity. He was blameless and upright, and he feared God and shunned evil. Now, if you're familiar with Job's story, you know what is he about to experience? A ton of evil. And scripture wants us to know in the first two sentences, though this man experienced a ton of evil, he shunned evil. It's an interesting word if you do a word study on it, but essentially what Job's mentality was is though evil is done to me, it'll never be done through me. I I think this is a mentality of someone with spiritual maturity. Though evil is done to me, it'll never be done through me. And that was Job's mentality. He understood, I live in a fallen, broken, wicked, and at times evil world, but I'm not going to participate. Like the old saying goes, you are either part of the problem or you're part of the solution. And Job said, I am part of the solution. It goes on to tell us that he had seven sons and three daughters. He owned 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys, and had a large number of servants. He was the greatest man among all the people of the East. And what you find in here are some really interesting details that establish the book of Job. I would be in the camp of people who believe that the book of Job is one of two of the oldest books in the Bible. It's up for debate as to which is the oldest, Genesis or Job. And and you may ask, well, well, how do you know that? And there's some things in there that if you were to pay attention or do your own study, you would find uh, this actually lines up with what is known in biblical history as the patriarchal era. And one detail is in the patriarchal era, before any currency was established, wealth was determined by a person's possessions. How many kids that they had, how many donkeys, sheep, goats, livestock, land, that's how you determine and identified a person's wealth. And that's exactly how they identified the wealth of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In addition to that, throughout the book of Job, God is referred to as El Shaddai, which again is something you only see in the patriarchal era. Uh, with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's no mention of the law. And in addition to that, there's no reference of the Exodus. So if you go to the pages of scripture, what you will find is the writers are constantly building on the anchor point of the Exodus and the law and the nation of Israel. And what you find in 42 chapters is there's no reference uh, to any of those things. And you can go on down the list, but this is a very old book. And what you find in the story of Job is this man had a thriving faith, a relevant faith, a strong and important productive faith, yet he did not have almost all of the things that you and I rely upon to supplement our faith. It's really amazing how much faith he had 
uh, when you consider how little he had. The law was not in place. Christ had not arrived on the scene. Death was not defeated. Christ had not resurrected. The Holy Spirit was not imparted into humanity. The local church was not launched and established. And God's written revelation was not compiled into a library now known as the Bible. I mean, think of how well he did in his faith without all the things you and I find critical to living a life of faith. And what's interesting about Job is Job's living a good life. God's been good to him. He's made wise decisions, and he is now experiencing the byproduct of a wise decision and a wise way of living. And simultaneously, unbeknown to Job, the the writer pans the camera. And the writer lets us know that while this godly man is going about his business and living a good, wise, and fruitful life, something else is happening at the same time. And what we're going to read next, just know it makes all of us uncomfortable, myself included. In fact, in my academic studies amongst all my peers, uh, everyone finds this passage uh, to be uncomfortable. Uh, But it's God's word and facts are not determined by our ability to tolerate them. Whether you like it or not is not what determines a a fact in in situations. And it says in verse 6, one day... The angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered the Lord, pay attention to how he says this, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Now, there's no question this is strange stuff to talk about. I 100% believe in a spiritual realm, and I believe that there is constantly a spiritual war taking place, whether we acknowledge it or are fully aware of it. I believe in angels, and I believe in demons. I believe in an eternal, perfect, holy, and righteous God, and I believe in a puny adversary known the devil who has already been defeated by the cross. I I believe in this, and that is the case, but it's still weird anytime you talk about Satan or the devil or demons, doesn't it just make you feel like, where where are we going here? And I will say that in this one sentence, what you find is uh, two truths about Satan uh, that run against the grain of what most people believe about the devil. And I would say most people are giving the devil way too much credit. And so there's two things you need to understand about the devil. One, he's not omnipresent. God is, but the devil's not. And it says that he roams from one place to the next, but he's not in all places at the same time. He's not omnipresent, which means a lot of times what you and I are bumping into in terms of spiritual warfare, a lot of times we're not bumping into the devil, uh, but we would be bumping into very demonic forces. Scripture is very clear that the devil has a legion of demons at his disposal trying to accomplish his uh, agenda. But he's not omnipresent. And though they are annoying and this is a disruption in our life, this is a defeated team. This would be the equivalent of the Detroit Pistons. They are a lost cause. (laughs) And they're still going to show up on our calendar and they're still going to try to win a game here and there. Um, But we're going to make the playoffs and they're going to be fishing somewhere in Cancun. And... I I think it's important to understand that uh, and to know that the devil has bigger problems to deal with than you because he knows how the story ends. He knows, maybe you don't, but he does that Jesus Christ will return again and the second coming of Christ is going to happen. And I know it's stuff that, you know, preachers aren't talking about anymore, but it's a huge miss. Christ returns again, folks, and maybe something to do in your life group or in your personal devotional time is to read about the second coming of Christ. The first time he showed up, he dealt with the penalty of sin. Uh, The second time he arrives, he redeems and rescues the saints for all eternity. It's a beautiful thing. And so the devil is fully aware doomsday is on his calendar, and he's got bigger things to worry about. Uh, But we do bump into spiritual warfare, and he's not omnipresent. Uh, In addition to that, he's not omniscient. 
He doesn't know everything. He does not have access to your thoughts. Do not give the devil that type of credit. He is a manipulator, and a manipulator can only work with what you give him to work with. That's why scripture says the devil makes his way around like a roaring lion seeking those he may devour. And he can only devour what you divulge. So sometimes it's just learning, hey, uh, he doesn't have access and I don't need to give it to him. In fact, I don't even think you can call him a him. It's an it. And he's not omniscient. But what scripture would establish for you and I is Satan ultimately means accuser. And scripture tells us that he is the father of lies and where he is most productive and most active and most busy is in the form of accusation and lies. And that is established right off the bat here in one of the oldest books of the Bible in Job. It says he, he went to and from uh, on the earth. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Which if you were to do a deeper dive into that statement, which sometimes I don't think you need to overdo this. You don't need to uh, become doubtful about your translation of the Bible. But how it would have more accurately been implied is I know you're considering my servant Job. That, that's how God is saying it to him. I know you're considering my servant Job. There's no one like him on the earth. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing, Satan replied? Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands and everything he has. You have blessed, oh sorry, you have blessed the work of his hands that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. And this is where it gets uncomfortable. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your power, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. And then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. This is, uh, again, it's, it's weird to talk about. It's sometimes uncomfortable to talk about. But unbeknown to Job, Job is living a wise, good, righteous, blameless life. And unbeknown to him, there is this interaction in the spiritual realm between God and Satan. And God makes a deal with Satan. And what you find is Satan cannot do anything outside the permission of God. God has to permit it. Which is, again... As you get through the pages of Job, you are oftentimes uncomfortable by what God is allowing to take place in this man's life. And maybe you've been uncomfortable by the things you have experienced that you've thought, why is God allowing this to happen to me? Come on, church, I'll be the most honest place on the planet. Wave at me if you've ever thought, why, God, are you allowing this to happen to me? And here is the assumption that Job is making. Job is making an assumption about the family of God. He's saying the only reason why Job loves you is because you've spoiled him. Look how good his life is. Look how wealthy he is. But you take away all that favor and blessing upon his life, you remove the goodness upon his life, and he'll turn his back on you immediately. Essentially, what he is saying is, God, Job doesn't love you for who you are, he loves you for what you give him. And that's a thought-provoking question. Why do you love God? Do you love God because he's God, because he's righteous, because he's holy, because he's eternal, because he's the creator of all things, because he holds the world in the palm of his hands? Do you love him because he's God, or do you love him just because of the things he does for you? Essentially what Job is saying is this would be like, Christmas time coming around where every single year your child loves Santa because Santa delivers presents. And do a social experience, uh, experiment in your home. One year, don't have any presents under the tree and see how your child's heart turns towards Santa. He would be canceled in one year. And what you find is Job is in this position. Satan is making an assumption and God is saying, try him. It's really an amazing thing because in this moment, unbeknown to Job, God is saying, 
you put my son to the test and see if he doesn't triumph over you. So uh, Job is a beautiful foreshadow of Christ. He endures significant pain and suffering, yet he stands triumphant in the end. And what you find for Job, and maybe you can relate to this, Job was assigned a never envisioned task. You ever looked at your life and thought, man, I did not see this one coming. You ever looked at your life and thought, I didn't pray for this. In my wildest imagination, I couldn't have predicted this. But for whatever reason, this sovereign God who holds the world in the palm of his hands, who has a plan and a purpose for all humanity, including me, has decided to put this on my list as an assignment. I never envisioned this task. And what God is allowing Job to do is to defeat the devil himself. It's a really powerful thing. He, it almost as if God wants humanity to know you're greater than you think. It, it's a powerful thing. And what happens after this moment? Job loses everything. I mean, it is gut-wrenching. It's probably one of the hardest portions to read in the Bible. He loses all 10 of his children. He loses all of his possessions. Everything is plundered. And my question for you is when you go through pain or when you have faced your hardest moments in life, how did you respond? I think if I were to look at my life and I were to pile up all the pain, all the inconvenience, all the sorrow, all the grief, all the times in which I've mourned, all the times in which I was frustrated and perplexed by the evil and wickedness and just trials of my life, and I were to pile it all together, there's no doubt in my mind it would fail to compare to everything Job went through. I mean, what Job went through is certainly in many ways an outlier. And my question again is, when you go through your hardest moments in life, how do you respond? Because scripture tells us how Job responded. And if you go to chapter two, or sorry, chapter one, verse 20, it says, at this, Job got up and tore his robe, shaved his head, and then he fell to the ground in worship. That almost seems like a typo. You worshiped God after losing everything. You worshiped God in the midst of a crisis. You worshiped God in extreme pain. And what you find is Job had this unwavering confidence in God, this unwavering trust in his goodness. And so even in the, the deepest, darkest moments of his life, his response, his impulse, his instinct was still to worship and to acknowledge and to remind his soul of who his God is, which is what worship does. Worship reminds your soul of who your God is. It says he fell to the ground in worship, saying, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will repart, depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. I mean, isn't that the temptation? To uh, get frustrated with God, begin to doubt God, begin to assume that uh, he's not good, he's not caring, he's not powerful, he's not all-knowing. It makes us consider these things. And what you find in Job is a remarkable faith. And like Kobe Bryant, who is well-documented but not well-duplicated, Job's story is well documented. But in the community of faith at large, I think it's safe to say, and this is no judgment on you, I would put myself in this category, it's not well duplicated. You look at the standards in which Job lived out his faith and every single one of us thinks to ourselves, whoa, who can live like that? How do you develop such a high trust in God? In fact, Job's friends show up and they've got some questions and they've got some thoughts and opinions. In fact, Job's wife is even perplexed. Like, Job, what are you thinking and what are you doing? And look what his wife says to him in chapter two, verse nine. 
His wife said to him, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Man, what, what a statement. Are you still trying to maintain your integrity? What, what Job proves to us is you can have a bad day and not become a bad person. And when things go wrong, don't go with them. Because pain has a way of opening the door for foolishness. Every single one of us, you're gonna go through trials, you're gonna go through pain, you're gonna go through situations that are absolutely perplexing, you're gonna bump into hatred, you're gonna bump into evil, you're gonna bump into wickedness, and there's gonna be a part of you that says, oh, like, just for a moment, can I waffle in my character? Just for a moment, God, can you give me a free pass to come up short in my integrity? And she says, are you still trying to maintain your integrity? Curse God and die which I think sometimes for all of us, you can read those words and it is easy to judge this woman, but know this, um, Job's not the only one who lost everything. This poor woman also lost everything. And where she is at mentally, she's saying, I would rather die. I've lost my children, I've lost everything. Curse God and die. And, and Job says, you talk like a foolish woman. Should we accept only good things from the hand of God and never anything bad. So in all of this, Job said nothing wrong. Should we only accept good things, but nothing bad? And Job knew, hey, pain opens the door for foolishness. And it's just raising the awareness in your life because what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna start asking God for a 24-hour pass. You ever ask that God for a 24-hour pass? God, these people are crazy. Just, you're, I know you're the great physician, but if you can give me 24 hours to administer a taste of their own medicine, uh, that would be nice. Anyone else, you just had some faulty nature bubble up in you? Yeah, it's a real thing. And what is interesting is Job doesn't. He, he maintains his character and it's a, it's a fascinating thing. Again, well-documented, but not well-duplicated. And when Kobe Bryant was playing the game of basketball, uh, there were a lot of interviews, a lot of conversations and questions regarding his work ethic and his mindset. And uh, one year, he was uh, in the middle of an interview, is during the playoffs, and someone asked him about it, and he said, you know, I read this book, and it had a profound impact on my life. And that book is called Jonathan Livingston Siegel. It's written by a guy by the name of Richard Bach, who was born in the 1930s, who became a, um, a pilot for the Navy and was obsessed and fascinated by aviation. And he's seen all these ties between aviation and philosophy and how life works. And so he writes this book, and the book is all about seagulls. Now, Kobe didn't expound in the interview as to what... Uh, about it had a profound impact on his life. The synopsis of the book is there is a flock of seagulls and basically they use flying as a means to an end, uh, as a way of getting to the next scrap of food so they can eat. And Jonathan Livingston Seagull is this ostracized seagull who uh, finds himself on the outside of the camp where he hangs out by the cliffs and while others are just flying to get the next piece of food, he's out on the cliffs trying to perfect flying. And he's pushing himself to the limits and he's stumbling through the air. He's taking on physical pain. He's at time getting hurt and he is just failing after failing, but he won't stop trying where others seen it as a means to an end. For him, his mind was, I'm going to love and appreciate and get the most out of flying. And I will say, I don't know much about Richard Bach, and for awareness, I don't just read Christian books because you just don't attune your ear to Christian sources. So as your pastor, I'm constantly reading things that are having an influence in our culture. I would say that I don't know where he's at spiritually. There are certainly some themes that you could maybe draw some lines to Christianity. Obviously, many know that Kobe, in the later years of his career, was very outspoken about his faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, I don't know, but what I found to be interesting uh, about the book is Jonathan Livingston Siegel, he, he cracks the code on flying. At one point, he flies up to 200 miles per hour, and eventually he 
uh, attracts this ragtag group of other seagulls uh, who shared his aspirations for flying. And he begins to uh, train them in his ways. And in many ways, it's kind of a, like a discipleship model. And he basically tells them, hey, we all need to go back to our flocks so we can teach other people how to fly better. And that's what happens, and they have this run for a while, but eventually the, the seagulls start passing away. The original group, the original protégés, they start passing away. And what the rest of the flocks do, and this is the part that I found interesting, is they start to build shrines around Jonathan's original protégés. And so they start to, you know, these seagulls start to build piles of pebbles. And eventually over time, everybody stops flying the way Jonathan and his protégés taught them to fly. In fact, over time, um, the, so much time passes that the, the flocks start to assume that people never actually flew like that. That's just a fairy tale. And I say that because when I was reading that, I was like, man, I see that kind of happen in the community of faith a lot of times. We, we look at the Bible and we oftentimes want to experience the God of the Bible without living like the people of the Bible. And what you find is there was an approach to life. There was a level of faith. There was a level of trust and confidence in the goodness and the sovereignty of God that was embodied in the legends of scripture like a Job that is not duplicated in today's uh, current community of faith at large. And there are some who will look at Job's story and think, that's unrealistic. No one ever trusted God to that level. Uh, but I believe Job did. In fact, what I love about Job is he was given a, a never-envisioned task, but he maintained a never-ending trust. That is what is so fascinating to me about Job. Through it all, he is unwavering in his belief. Hey, God is good. God is good. I, I trust him. And so what you find is his friends show up and his friends initially get it right. And how do they get it right? They show up and they're present and they're silent. Where things go wrong is when they open their mouth. And what they start to do is they start to present to Job all their theories about his suffering. And they start to say things like, well, you must have unrepented sin in your life or you must have disobeyed God and what you're going through is God's punishment on your life. Wave at me if you've ever heard this type of logic. Yeah, it's super dysfunctional within the community of faith. In fact, you find it in the gospels, Jesus making his way throughout the region and the disciples seeing you know, people with illnesses around them and asking the question, uh, are they going through this because their parents were cursed? Is, is this a byproduct of the sin in their life? You certainly see this uh, in the life of Paul. Paul was shipwrecked in prison, went through a lot of trials. In fact, much of his writing in 1 and 2 Corinthians is establishing with the church, my suffering doesn't disqualify me. My suffering is the very thing that confirms my calling. And what we have to be careful of is when you have someone in your life who goes through great suffering, be very careful you don't take the liberty to start self-diagnosing it. Because what happens is, especially when you clothe your theory in God talk, you create biblical weaponry that then hurts and marks the person and jades their you know, idea or their perspective on this good heavenly father of theirs. So every single one of us as followers of Christ need to be gentle and considerate and at times much more silent yet present when people are suffering. Just be careful. And Job, he's going through all this stuff. He's getting all this wonky advice. He's getting pushed back from his own wife. And there comes this point that amazes me in chapter 19. Verse 25, Job declares, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand on the earth. I mean, what a statement. Job has this mentality, and long before the law, long before the prophets, long before Christ resurrected and proved life beyond the grave, something in Job believed and was confident that even if I die, 
God will redeem me. I, I think Job knew, hey, even losing my children, I'm going to get them back. I didn't lose them. I know where to find them because my God is good. And when all is said and done, he will stand triumphant upon the earth because my redeemer lives. It's a great, it's a great thought. And what is amazing to me, again, is how much faith he has with so little. You and I are so blessed to live on this side of history. Our faith is very supplemented. We have scripture, we have churches, we have worship music, we have small groups, we have curriculum, we have books, we have all the things that can help us thrive in our life with faith. Yet isn't it interesting that with all of our supplements, we've developed a shallow faith and with so little, he had a remarkable deep faith. And again, I think the invitation for all of us is to stare into the pages of scripture and ask the question, what would it look like for me to develop a greater trust in God? What would it look like for me to stay faithful knowing that my redeemer lives and when all is said and done, he will be triumphant. And Job is, through the entire book, finding himself deeper and deeper into pain and suffering. And it makes me think of this article I recently read uh, about bear hunting, which for the record, I, I know nothing about bear hunting. I've never bear hunted. This is me trying to connect with all people. And what was interesting to me about the article is it was talking about a, a lot of hunters will use traps when hunting a bear. And also they will use dogs to flush out the bears. And in the, this article, it said that at times a dog will get caught in a bear trap. And what really piqued my interest is it says that in that moment, the dog is off, obviously frantic and stressed out, paranoid and in a rough state of mind, does not wanna be touched, bothered with. And it says in that moment, if the dog does not have a great deal of trust in the hunter, it'll never be set free. Because here's what it said in the article. It said, in order for the hunter to get the dog out of the trap, the hunter has to push the dog deeper into the trap. It's the only way to get him out, is to push the dog deeper into it. And if the dog doesn't trust him, the dog will never be free. And a lot of times we, we experience a very similar dynamic. God, why is this happening? Life comes with a resounding why. And a lot of times God is gently and sovereignly pushing us through it all, knowing, hey, if you will just trust me, if you will take me at my word, I will develop a freedom and a strength and a wisdom and a peace, and I will fortify your life, and you will come out on the other side of this. But you have to trust me as I lead you through it. And how the book ends is just so fascinating to me. God is pretty much silent the whole time. You ever found that someone hit the mute button on God in your life? Job has all these questions and it's actually interesting how Job talks to God and his friends talk about God. You ever notice that difference? It's really easy to talk in theory about God, but you can always tell when someone has a genuine relationship with God because they talk directly to him. And God speaks up and God, for a couple chapters, just starts to run the gauntlet on questions. And this is how he sets it up. Chapter 38, verse one. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. And he said, who is this that obscures my plans? with words without knowledge. Who is it that obscures my plans with words without knowledge? Who are you to think you're brighter than me is what God is saying. And C.S. Lewis has this book called The Problem of Pain. And in it, he says, you know, you can ignore pleasure, but you have to attend to pain. That God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. C.S. Lewis says, pain is God's megaphone. It gets your attention. And in it, he makes this statement. He says, every single one of us is going to play a part 
in accomplishing God's purpose in the world. And then he says this, the question is, who will you serve as? A John or a Judas? Regardless, we're all going to play a part in bringing his purpose to pass. He says, who speaks of my purposes with words without knowledge? He says, brace yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Which again, we get exposed in the book of Job because we think this is backwards. God, I have some questions and you report to me. And folks, God doesn't report to me and he doesn't report to you. Every single one of us reports to him. He's God, amen? And so he says, brace yourself, I have some questions. And just to give you a taste of some of these questions, he says, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely you know who stretched a measuring line across it while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. He, he goes on to say, hey, who tells the morning to wake up? Who tells the sun to go to bed? Who tells the morning dew to lie upon the grass? Who does these things? And what he does is he establishes question after question after question, and he establishes with Job, okay, there are things my finite mind will never understand about an eternal God. And that is where these four words come into play. I believe you can summarize the entire Bible in four words. And those four words establish two truths. And here it is. Four words, two truths. He's God. I'm not. Oh my goodness, would we do ourselves a favor to remind ourselves often He's God. I'm not. And this is amazing to me because watch how, watch how Job responds. When all said and done, God's done rattling off his questions. Then Job replied to the Lord. This is chapter 42. I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, who is that that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me to know. And here's the thing, you can push back on that and be like, well, that's nonsense. Uh, but if you're a parent, you've actually experienced this. You ever had to take your child to the doctor's office to get a shot? I remember my first time doing this solo. Riley was born when I was 25. I remember when she was three years old. I took her to get a shot. It's a 25-year gap between me and my daughter. Consider the gap between you and an eternal God. I take my daughter to this doctor's office. She's about to get a shot, and I have no idea. How do I explain to her what's about to happen? Riley, in any moment, a complete stranger is going to walk through that door. I'm going to put you in a full Nelson. And she is going to stab you in the leg with a needle. Because I love you. And you've been there. You're holding your child. They're looking you in the eyes and they're thinking, why in the world are you allowing a stranger to stab me? How is this love? But every single one of us knows there's certain things a 28-year-old can't explain to a three-year-old. And there's certain things that an eternal God cannot explain to a finite mind. He's God, I'm not. He's God, I'm not. And when all is said and done, all I know is Job was given a never envisioned task, yet he developed a never ending trust and it was nothing but net. And, oh, I forgot to share with you this. This is interesting. So you can see this experiment done in a few different places. There are two balls at the same height, and they are traveling to the same point at the bottom. They are released at the same time. Question one, which road would you rather travel? The top one. 
Question two, which ball gets to the bottom first? And the assumption is, well, the top one does. And what you find in the experiment is the bottom ball gets to the bottom first because here's the brilliant thing about it. Somehow, these valleys generate momentum. And guys, I don't know why it happens and I don't know why God chooses to function this way, but you go through a valley, you go through pain, you go through suffering, and through it all, you develop an understanding that God was with you, that God was for you, that he was productive, and somehow it generated a spiritual momentum in your life, but you have to maintain a never-ending trust, amen?